Anybody ever heard of the station? Yes. Where? It's uh, Riverside Spring Road. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're welcome everybody here tonight. Um, you know, we're glad to have everybody here at, uh, in the audience and online to uh, this edition of uh, your County Writers Roundtable. Uh, Jamie and Dawn can't make it here tonight, so you got me. So I uh, guess that, that's best we'll do here tonight, but they're here in spirit, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, the Writers Roundtable was a time that we've uh, come together for since about 2015. Uh, and as a time for networking. And tonight, for example, I met Gary Highland for the first time, and maybe others did too, who were friends. Gary Patty Highland, who, if you're on Facebook, you know that name, and you know he's an expert on uh, anything on rules on rails. And uh, so it, it, it was great to meet him in person after knowing him digitally for, for all these years and, and, and learning about his hot, hot mob recipes and so on, which, which, are, which look delicious. Uh, so, but then also another part of this is that this isn't just writers and researchers and so forth. The Writing Ground Table has long been for members of the public as well. And it's an opportunity to collaborate and trade ideas and, and so on. So welcome to everybody uh, here tonight. What happens is we have 15 minutes of doing business on various things, including members talking about some of their, their projects and books. And then we'll go with the main event when uh, Charlie Stanbaugh comes in to talk about Forest Park down in Hanover. So it'll be about 15 minutes into the program here tonight. So, Nicole, would you like to, um, you know, tell us what's going on at the History Center? Sure. Nicole Smith. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, just a couple of announcements about History Center programs before we get started. Uh, coming up on Sunday, um, March 5th, Tyler Stump will be presenting Pennsylvania Prison Records for the Genealogy Society. Next, uh, second Saturday, is, speaker is Tom Davidson speaking about Mail and Haynes and the Shoe House. Our York Civil War Roundtable program is um, speaker is Randy Dreyas speaking about women at Gettysburg. And we have a special webinar coming up. I'm sorry, I think it's an in-person program. I'm not sure about that. I gotta check. But March 25th, Historic Preservation in Your Community with Mindy Crawford from Preservation Pennsylvania. And last but not least, um, we're having a distinguished speaker series, um, which we do every three years. So I don't know the series, but anyway, <laughs> we're having a distinguished speaker <laughs> who is author Eric Larson. He'll be speaking at for us at the Appell Center on April 18th. So for more information about your County History Center programs, please visit yorkhistorycenter.org. Okay. I, <laughs> sorry, Charles. Um, Jim asked me to say a few words about the upcoming journal of York County Heritage. As you know, we publish um, every fall, usually September. This edition will have six uh, uh, articles by local authors. Um, I can maybe talk about each one of them. Uh, just, uh, just name the names, maybe not the topic. Okay. Uh, our authors are Dwayne Allen, uh, Stephen Smith, um, Stephen Nicholas, uh, Dr. Ben Hoover, Jim McClure, and Dr. Jane Sutton. And it should be a good one. So look forward to that. And I'm going to turn it over to Jim, who's going to introduce Charles. And Charlie, we'll have you wait just a few more minutes because we want to have, uh, you know, members tell about their projects, which is a normal thing that we do here. Uh, and then we'll have another little special part of this introduction. The, uh, so anybody want to talk about your projects, what you're working on? Uh, yeah. Ms. Rich? Good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Rash. I'm with the Heritage Commission for the West Manhattan Township. We're currently working on a book about Peter Dix Bloomery, which is uh, in Spring Grove. We're working with Tom and um, 
Kudorsk Alley and, and uh, Spring um, Grove Historical Society to, to try to find other locations. We were unsuccessful in the bloomery. There was a mill also before the paper mill. There's another mill in Spring Grove, which is identified in the um, charter um, when Spring Grove was adopted. We recreated that 1881 survey uh, only to discover that the mill was probably excavated out when Spring Grove, when Peach Clapper relocated um, the stream after the 1933 floods. But we have a lot of background history of things that went on in that area. Um, and going back to West Mannheim, uh, we did complete a um, another ground penetration, ground penetration radar site work for the uh, Marianne Furnace. Um, Jerry Jones is going to have an archaeological dig. Uh, he's got scheduled for um, June the 19th. Um, and I think it's for school, high school age uh, students uh, interested in, you know, there's a fee for that. And, um, and I'll let Tom talk about the Southwestern Historian discussions. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, uh, great. Anything to talk about? Want to pitch? Great to have you. I am Greg Halpin, the Chief Historian for the York City Fire Department. Uh, my big uh, completion of a project, I guess, which happened since the last meeting, was I finally got my first book published, right. We Strive to Save. That was thanks to some uh, encouragement, some information from Jim at the last Writers' Roundtable that got it done. Available here at the History Center in the bookstore and on Amazon. So I'm thrilled with that. I've sold over 100 copies, so I'm like super thrilled. And I'm working on the next book, which should be a in-depth history of the Rex and Laurel Fire Station. So hopefully it won't take as long as this one. This has had about five years of research on So on to the next one. Great. Thanks, Craig. That's great. First book, having the first book in the hopper. Yep. That, that's wonderful. Okay. Um, you know, one of the, anybody else have anything you want to uh, talk about? Um, any other members? You know, come on up. A big part of uh, the Rogers Roundtable in our eight years of existence has been for folks to pitch their projects. And it's amazing the connections that are sometimes made when someone talks about a project, someone else has information to help that project. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Annette from Spring Grove Museum. I just wanted to make people aware about a year ago, we had a gentleman come in and talk about conservation of cemeteries. And we will be having one. We will be back now, and it will be Friday, April 14th through Sunday, April 16th. It's half day, uh, day and a half in classroom type thing, and the other part is at the cemetery. And we will be going to the Spring Grove Cemetery. Um, the gentleman had, that came before was Robert Musco of Musco Cemetery Monument Services, and he will be the man conducting the training. So. Always welcome, up to 25. Thank you. Thank you. It's good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the things we, we've talked about a little bit already tonight is collaboration, you know, doing things. At one time, and it's probably not in too distant uh, past, each of our local uh, historical societies kind of went on their own. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a, a great confluence of, uh, I think that's probably the word, a collaboration that, that's that's uh, going on. For example, I just saw over the weekend that you know these great rivals in downtown Redline, you know the football teams and so forth, the traditional rivals. Well, the downtown historical society went over and, and toured the Redline Museum, you know, and uh, you know it's what a, what a wonderful moment that was. And we know we have other things, you know, the History Center in their steam plant script, you know, for their new museum. They have. Um, like a logo that points uh, museum goers to various sites around the county that applies. You want to dig deeper, we go to these sites. So there's another example of, the, of, of that uh, collaborative spirit. And then just think about the Friends of Lebanon Cemetery and this Friends of the City Cemetery, the two, those two uh, restoration efforts. There's, there's commonality between those two groups. So those are a couple of examples, but, and we have here tonight, Tom Ying from Dolores Valley Historical Society. I'm gonna talk about other collaborations, uh, maybe collaborations that 
or that supplement this list that I just gave you. So, Tom, you want to tell us about what's going on down in southwest New York County? Sure. So, this should leave uh, about 10 minutes for you, Charles, to uh, do that presentation. <laughs> All right. Tom Ewing from uh, Cadores Valley Area Historical Society. I had that up. And uh, one of the things that Jim was just talking about is what we've uh, coined the phrase uh, Southwestern New York County Historical Consortium. And what that is, we're just, we've had two meetings so far, and the groups involved are Glen Rock Historic. Preservation Society, the Miller Wagon and Carriage Museum, Spring Grove Area Historical Preservation Society, the Cadoras Valley Area Historical Society, Friends of the Heritage Rail Trail Corridor, Heritage Committee of West Mannheim Township, and the Hanover Area Historical Society, basically the southwest corner of York County. And what this is, is our purpose is to determine that these individual groups can work together to increase awareness of southwest York County area. Uh, history by jointly bringing awareness to the public of the existence of each group and the story we have to tell, where we are unique and where we combine our stories together, and also to attempt to create a broader area that becomes a historic destination to visit, to let people know that if they make the effort to travel there, or travel there, they have the option to visit multiple museums. And so sometimes, like, especially the smaller museums, particularly like ours, you might be able to spend an hour there uh, looking to see what we have. It may not be worth somebody coming from Newburytown or Harrisburg or some other place to travel there. However, if we can make the area a destination uh, there where they could see multiple museums, it could be more attractive for them. And also, we get to share our story with a lot more people. So we're working at that. Uh, we're not sure what it's going to look like yet. We're not looking to create another historic society. We don't need any more organizations necessarily, but uh, yet we need to organize to try to pull this off. It might be more of a marketing type thing. The other thing we're working on, and I'm working on, I guess it's my personal project. I'm hoping to expand it to some other groups, but it's a GIS or Geographic Information System. It's a project telling history of the region um, through and throughout the Forest Valley area which uh, using digital map and uh, the internet to begin to share our story. So you already use Google maps and that kind of stuff. That's sort of a GIS thing. So this would be basically being able to tag a location, say what's the history of this particular location on here and, uh, and just uh, bringing in pictures, stories that we, that we can collect. And um, you know, I'm still trying to formulate all this. I have a, uh, last semester, yeah, last semester with your college, I worked with a, a young intern who uh, helped me begin putting the, the foundation in on this thing. So it's interesting what he came up with and, and need to develop it some more. And I guess the other couple other projects I'm working on in, uh, is flint mills. Uh, just discovered the whole concept of flint mills, uh, in which it was sort of came in later in the stage of history of mills in York County. So that's an interesting thing. We had a couple, I think, I believe one of the first mills, Clint Mills, was in Spring Grove. Uh, and then the last thing I'm working on, something Jim just uh, made me aware of through a fellow from Stuttgart, Germany, that uh, basically he's trying to track down a guy by the name of Henry, uh, uh, yeah, Kerr, who possibly is the first organ manufacturer in York County. He was, believe it or not, he came to Jefferson to begin with from Baltimore. Well, first he came from Germany. To Baltimore and to Jefferson and then New York and from there went other places. But he's an interesting fellow. It's an interesting story. And I've been pretty fascinated with that whole thing. So uh, thank you, Jim, for bringing that guy to my attention. Tom, um, once, once I uh, talk about uh, Facebook sharing at all. Okay. Okay. One of the things that one uh, area of collaboration that we're seeing more and more of is is the one group sharing. Facebook post to another group. And I know it's happening now in Spring Grove, uh, and that's it. Kennedy, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because okay. I, I see you're doing a lot of that. Yeah, uh, yeah. basically, uh, anything from Hanover, I believe we can have a post or two coming in from uh, the York History Center and, um, and, and Spring Grove and ourselves and um, some other places that have Facebook pages when they have announcements or just even topics of interest. We post it on each other's websites and our Facebook pages, and it's 
it brings a lot of attention and it, it draws people back and forth to the various groups, makes everyone aware of what we're out there. It really broadens the audience that's out there. Some people are seeing the same post a couple of different places, but that's okay. The important thing is that uh, we're sharing this information and Facebook is uh, coming in an interesting place where it's gathering history. I guess it remains to be seen how accessible it is down the road. Yeah. as to finding this information. But there's some really neat stuff and people share private pictures you wouldn't normally see uh, and, and stories or whatever. So it's it's been pretty neat uh, seeing that. So yeah, it's been fun being able to jointly uh, work together with, with Facebook. Great. Yeah, I think, there, I think there is the idea that if you're running a Facebook group or a Facebook page, that, that there's something wrong if you share it to someone else's Facebook group or page. There isn't. That's what Facebook's about. It's about sharing. And you are doing a really effective job of that down in the southwestern area. Uh, and yeah, you could be do see it a couple of times on your news feed. You may not read it one time, but you might read it the other time. So I, I think that's a really good way to collaborate. And uh, so now we're so thank you, Tom. Thank you for that, uh, that all that information. Now we're here to uh, use uh, uh, Charlie Stanbach. Stanbach. And, uh, you know, he's from Nechip. And I, I think that uh, the story is you thought about the name Nechip, Nechip, Northeast York County History and Preservation, when you're in the shower one time. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I told that story. You won't have to, but can you want to. But uh, anyway, um, you know, the, the Nechip operates on a, an array of platforms. And uh, also, and, uh, and Charlie does a lot of in, in speaking in schools and so forth around, which is yet another platform we do. Uh, in in person speaking, um, and also uh, Nechip won uh, a, a big award from the History Center right, this year. Show. Yeah, yes, the local organization award. So one of the things that Charlie did, he was an early um, early adopter of this idea called uh, uh, "Do It Yourself Urbanism" or informal urbanism. And what basically that what that means, and we see it. There's several examples in town here. The uh, city cemetery is an example. The um, left the cemetery example is when you see a need, you go out and, and just deal with it. And it doesn't mean you don't involve the uh, municipality involved and the and people involved. You don't do it, you know, behind people's backs. But you do it. You know, you make sure people are informed, and you just go ahead and provide the sweat labor, which Charlie has done. You saw a need out in the uh, uh, Manchester area for a history, a, a intensely local history group, and he went and did it. And uh, there, and so we see that a lot more, more and more examples of that in York County. And I actually did a post on witnessing York about all the examples I could think of. Uh, and uh, it's a growing list. So we're honored here to have Charlie. Charlie will be talking about uh, Forest Park and really York County trolleys, the trolley parks, but mainly focusing on Forest Park. So uh, Charlie, glad to have you tonight. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. I am Charles Stamble, founder and current president of Northeastern York County History and Preservation, DJ for sure. We are a 501 nonprofit organization for 2016. We focus on the history of Northeastern York County. 150 year old house has been uh, torn down to make room for 140 apartments. It would be as if we had never existed. So that's why Nietzsche wants to make local history interesting and hopes that it will provide appreciation for the past, inspire future generations, and restore community pride. It's important to have strong leadership, but backed by supporting volunteers. It is not a one person show. Nietzsche is fortunate to have many faithful board members and volunteers. Each have started on the internet. Every time I get a picture from somebody, I put it on the internet and it's all they tend to go to it. Seventy pages. We have two thousand two hundred local stories and pictures. We're one of the largest uh, website historical websites. We average of two point seven persons, a new persons a day is looking at it. 
Uh, we also have a, a, a internet or emailing with 375 people. We, we tell people that they remember when they're growing up or their grandparents um, and they can relate to it. I have pictures of, of old schools and they say, oh, there's my aunt, or there's my uncle, or there's my grandfather. And they really get into that. They really like that. We hosted the Huey landing in Edders. The other week we had a presentation of the Lincoln's casket uh, and we had the uh, Pennsylvania 87 volunteer um, and sort of war reenactors there. The next event was uh, talking with history. And we had a there at the uh, historical stadium in Manchester. These are in our county history showcase. Uh, some other things that we did, uh, we give presentations both on site and off site. We partner with the Redland Library. We do six presentations a year through the library system. Uh, during COVID, we called it Zoom into History. Now we're continuing on site there at the library. Another thing that we do is we get the local school district involved. At one of our events, 15 students came. They raised $150. We also have with the school district, we offer a sponsorship for students going into history. We have a scholarship program. Uh, this was the first year that we gave money. Every person in the past, in the present, and in the future are important. If we do not preserve our past, present, and future, then everything that we ever did personally will all be forgotten. We think the York History Center for our work and preserving the history. Thank you. Thank you. Said, um, I'm Stanwell. Um, uh, as far as the North East Green Rift County history, but Forest Park is in Hanover. I'll tell you why later on that we choose to participate. Just that time, one of the projects that we're currently working on, we're making instead of making books, we make uh, we make history videos, and we're currently working on the greatness of Mount Wolf. Uh, what is Nietzsche? <laughs> Nietzsche stands for Northeastern York County History in Preservation. And like my grandkid says, you pronounce it Nietzsche. If there's two vowels, the uh, the first one does the talking, the second does the walking. <laughs> Our mission is to preserve the history of Northeastern York County, which preserves these areas. I appreciate Tom, what Tom's doing with his group. He's my brother in law. Uh, we already included all these groups here, uh, and we're working with uh, some other ones here. Uh, this is our sixth year. We're babies in this. Uh, we are incorporated with the state. Uh, we have with the IRS and nonprofit organizations. Oh, we have guest speakers. Which one up did you know? Uh, we tour local facilities, uh, places. Uh, we do presentation for libraries, senior citizen centers, and other groups. Um, we also have, uh, we also partnered with the York County Library System to uh, bring Zoom into history. We also have scholarship funds for students preserve, uh, going into the studies of history. And like we said before, Egypt has an online uh, uh, website. We have over 90 pages, 30 people will honor uh, over 2000 pictures. Uh, 13 localities that we uh, we show 
260 links to other websites, and uh, we are referencing any blog. We have over 8,000 unique hits. Uh, hits uh, is the largest historical website in the county, and it's all done for free for us. Um, and we have a growing email list. Uh, there's our email, leechip.com. Uh, We have various items. I have some back on the table that you can uh, purchase. Like I said, we're big into videos, not into books, because it's cheaper to make videos and to make copies. Um, and uh, we do have one history book that, that I helped with, the History of Mountain Book. And we also have these great nifty uh, shirts that we sell. Oh, and you guys voted this as one of the top five in 2021, this Forest Park Talk. And I'm scheduled to give this talk six times more this year. I just like that music. Huh. Hey, found down memory lane and experience with me the birth and death. The Forest Park in Vanover, Pennsylvania. Let's go back to the early 1900s. A local family wanted to go on a picnic to Eckenborough Park, located in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Back then, the trolley was the easiest way to travel. Eckenberg Park consists of 16 wooden acres and was opened on June 25th, 1904. It had a picnic area, a playground, portion pits, and a small baseball field. It was planted by the trolley company. This was the seed for the future Forest Park. It was named after the previous land over, uh, owner, Captain Eckenbar. He was a Civil War captain who helped defend Hanover twice during the from the Confederates. He was a very successful businessman with his hand in many things in Hanover, including the railroad. There's our imaginary friends again. While they're waiting for their trolley ride, let's do some side tracking of our own. First of all, let's look at the development of the York County trolley system. On September 30th, 1886, the York Street Rail Company began with two, hor two one horse drawn cars traveling at a top speed of 15 miles an hour. And yes, someone had to go and clean the streets behind them. Six years later, they began operating their trolley cars electrically. The, stop, the top speed dropped to 13 miles an hour, but no more messy streets. During 1921, they had 68 trolley cars and 85 miles of track, recording almost a million riders. Here's a map of 1910, map of the trolley lines in York County. The dark lines are the completed railways. The dashes are the proposed lines, which were never developed. Notice that it was proposed to go to Carlisle, Mechanicsburg, and even Gettysburg. Until 1907, each line was were separated trolley operations. The York Hanover Rail Company was just one example. They then combined with the York Street Rail Company. However, the Hanover and the Sound Street Rail Company remained separate. In 1904, local newspapers were announcing that the York Street Rail Company's new Hanover line was open from Spring Grove for 65 cents. 
York Realm uh, residents could travel south to Hanover and back. The Hanover Metro Ringtown uh, Street Rail Company began service on September 8, 1893, connecting Adams and York County. By 1904, it ended at the park that they had started in Hanover. Now, let's look at the cost involved running a trolley. The initial costs include manpower and supplies to install about 100 miles of your county track. The rails were 60 pounds laid on oak and chestnut ties with limestone quarry. Some were laid through private properties and others through existing roads. When they crossed creeks or valleys, they had to build a bridge. Then they had to install about 100 miles of poles and wires. The voltage to the cars was over 6,000 volts. The power company charged 25 cents a day per car. For these reasons, several cars were converted to 600 volts DC, but these required random generating stations. They had continued maintenance costs of the tracks, wires, and trolleys. This maintenance station, station building on Hartley, Hartley Avenue near the York Fairgrounds. Then there was the cost of employees and the cars. To bring in additional revenue, they started delivering freight, packages, and even milk and eggs. Another making money-making idea was trolley parks. Oh, I see our imaginary friend called the trolley. Hang on as we ride through Hanover. They have restored the old York County trolley, which you can still ride at Rock Hill Trolley Museum. Oh, I see we, our friends made it to the park. Well, enjoy your picnic. You might be thinking, I never heard of this park. Where is it? Well, you take Route 30 West from New York at Cross Keys just before New Oxford, take 94 South. Then Route 94, wait till I get there. Then you take Route 94, turns into Baltimore Street, continuing to south to Mount Olive uh, Cemetery. Next to the cemetery is the South Hanover Mall. This is the former location of the park. Why were trolley parts established? Well, during the week, passengers kept the trolleys full of going back and forth to work. On the weekends, very few people rode them. So these companies decided to create trolley parks to boast weekend riders and profits. Edinburgh Park was special because both the York Street Rail Company and the Hanover Maturingstown Street Rail Company both stopped there. At one time, there was four trolley parks in your county. The first was Highland Park in West Manchester Township, started in 1891. The second was the Cold Springs Park in Manchester. Trolley cars brought many people from the far reaches of your county to Cold Springs and then to the nearby Elm Beach, where they swam in the Conewago Creek. The trolley bridge is in the top of the picture there. The third park was Brokeside in Dover, PA. The main attraction at the park was the 1986 Den Denwell uh, Carousel. The carousel was there until 1974. The carousel building is still standing. Uh, in, back in 1974, I actually had my picture taken on some of the uh, 
on the some of the horses that were still in there. Now back to the fourth part, Eckenberg Park in Hanover. The park was soon filled with people. There were several annual business, community, and church picnics. Over 34 family reunions came each year, the largest having over 300 members in the family. A 1,800 person per, uh, public trolley park station had to be added. As popularity grew at the park, so did the attractions. A brand new movie theater was built, a steam carousel was installed, a skating rink, a dance hall were added. Then there was a restaurant, horseshoe pits, petting zoo, playground, concession stands were open. A local church and lake for nighttime operation. Even the United Telephone Company even installed a telephone in a car. A lot of things were changed since our family first visited the park. It seemed like happy days would never end at the park. But, but, it was a tornado. The borough's damage in today's currency was over six million dollars. Uh, somehow I missed that second year. Okay, it struck in August 21st, 1915. The borough's damage in today's uh, currency was over six million dollars. Miraculously, there was no fatalities. At one location, telephone wires got tangled with trolley wires, which carried 6,000 volts. No one knew how to cut the extreme dangers high voltage. So chairman and vendor, he became a hero when he used an ax to break into the switch box and bravely pulled the switch. Sightseers soon came to Hanover in full force. The Hanover York Street Rail Company had to quickly add seven cars to the normal two-car trip. The company transported over 3,000 people that day back and forth from Hanover. Nine months after the tornado struck, they began preparing the park for the 1916 uh, season. While burning the leaves, guess what happened? The restaurant and picnic area were destroyed. The total damage was about $1,000, which equates to $2,000 a day. That was an expensive leaf burning project. In 1917, the U.S. entered World War I. Eckenbar Park was open to the troops and they honored the soldiers with weekly dances. Before the 1925 season, the rail company leased the park operations to Mr. Billy of Huntington, West Virginia for a one year period. He then changed the name to Forest Road Park. The first important decision that Mr. Bia made was to hire August Cursor Sr. to manage the park. Under the new management, many improvements were made. They replaced the existing carousel and added a Ferris wheel that they had shipped in from the park in Savannah, Georgia. Many small children's rides were added. They ex expanded the, uh, expanded the concession stands in the picnic area. It was changing from a trolley park to a amusement park. One of the attractions at the park that lasted to the end was the roller skating ring. In 1912, an Indian named Bright Star took over the management of the roller ring. 
Now, there was something unusual about the bathroom door there. They opened out into the ring. So whenever somebody was coming in or out of the bathroom, you better watch out for you got to down to the floor. Okay, the Purple family previously owned and managed a 10 more toilet park in a range world. They signed a 15 year contract to manage the Manage Forest Grove Park. However, after the first year, Things went so well that they decided to purchase the 16 acre park and become both manager and owner. It's soon shortened the name of the Forest Grove Park, just Forest Park. Forest Park was born. The birth date was March 26, 1926. Grand opening was April 23rd, 1926. Here's the family very ticket. Personally, invested $25,000 in the park, which today is $365. He added penny arcades, media galleries, fun house, a new ferret wheel, and a new parasail. Remember riding the parasail and trying to catch the golden rain? The park had three different parasails from 1907 to 1967. First, Denzel Carousel 1907 was installed during the first year of Denver Park. The second carousel was installed in 1925 when it became Forest Road Park. August did not like these animals, so he replaced them with the ones from his previous carousel, Denver. He still did not like it, so he sold it to a park far away in Alaska a year later. First year as far as Park, August wanted to be big and grand. The third carousel was installed in 1926. The diameter was 48 feet. It contains 50 hand carved animals and four coaches. It was the largest of its kind in the eastern US and the first to run a 50 horsepower motor. It was purchased from the White Rose Amusement Park here in North PA. In 1967, this carousel was sold to Aspen World in Houston. Then in 2005, uh, it was put up for sale. Hanover History Center wanted to purchase it, but the price was $1.2 million. It was too high for Hanover. <laughs> it was then sold, it was not sold, but retired to a dome at Six Flags Houston, where this flag is on. Now, this plaque reads, this old-time carousel was built in 1895. It features all the original animals for hard hand part and hard wood, as well as the original clipboard and drums. The history carousel was in continuous use in Hanover from 1907. 
Now, this is incorrect. This was not, it was prior to, in 1926. Um, it should say 1926. White Rose Community Music Park had it before um, Hanover did. And let's see here. And White Rose Park was uh, near Med Ed office, across from Faunus Lake. It's where it's located, where it's located. And until it was brought to, uh, and then continuing with the plaque, until it was brought to Ashton World, where it is currently housed in a unique stone structure. So something from your county still is in the history uh, museum area. Two major uh, uh, accidents happened at the park. May 11th, 1930, Martin McSherry from McSherry's town fell from the new roller coaster when he attempted to crawl from the front seat to the back seat in the car, then stood up in the seat while it was moving uphill. He suffered a broken leg and several lacerations and internal injuries. It was clearly his fault. Now, after it was after this, it was reported that August personally inspected each inch of the roller coaster every day after that for safety reasons. Then in 1964, Dave Gare died from standing in a fight during uh, and where several shots were fired. <laughs> There was a very special guest attractions, excitement, including Dunkey Basketball. And yes, there was a human butterfly and 3,000 year old money and lots of music. It was really a hot place at one time. The Greyhound's first incline was 73 feet in height, with a 10 ditch, 2,100 feet long, and ran like 50 horsepower. Uh, an electric motor was used to pull the cars up to the first incline. From there, the cars ran on their own. It took 125,000 feet of lumber, tons of steel, boats and st uh, steel, uh, 2,000 gold gallons of paint, electric light bulbs, salt, and big nighttime operation. All the materials were furnished by local merchants. It was later renamed the Roller Dippers. And the bottom here is a picture of Hanover from the Thompson uh, Roller Coasters. The Greyhound was built by John Miller of Homewood, Illinois, who was a widely known donor of roller coasters. August when it conducted but the death for Hanover. By now, the park had six up to date rides 14 uh, games, a balloon, a ballroom, roller. Skating rink, minutes of golf, enclosed picnic area, and most of all, more restrooms. A 40 foot, 40 foot Ferris wheel was a part of the park of the city. On April 23rd, 1934, school students could read it right at the tree. <laughs> Large crowds would come and be there to see five concerts and performances. During World War II, Forest Park became again hundred soldiers with Houston Hansen. Several local ladies can remember recall dancing with soldiers from Camp and Colt to Gettysburg, which was commanded by Captain White B. Arrington Howard.
and contributes to the war effort, the owners purchased a just basic application and converted to victory gardens. And they also had a stand to sell war bonds. After a century of trolleys, the automobiles and buses became the main means of transportation. By the late 1930s, trolleys were no longer brought, brought persons to cars park. August saw this coming and built a 1,000 car parking lot. <laughs> I imagine what our imaginary friend and family would think of the park now, 60 years later. August Sr. died, August 28, 1948, and his son, August, then took over. August's wife, Helen, said that they had taken many pictures of his park over the 40 years of success, but he had stored them in a barn. There's a lot of August in here. Well, you can get what happened. And now some of them enjoyed the park so much that he invited his friends to share their wonderful bedding, the forest park memory, and unfortunately very contentious to the same. For almost 60 years, the park grew even through a tornado, a fire, and two wars, several owners, the Great Depression, the decline of trolleys, the death of August Sr., and even in vice. But on August 18, 1966, The fire damage was estimated at over 100,000, which equates to 780,000 today. The Handover Evening Sun reported that for the 1967 season, they were going to rebuild the skiing rink and the picnic area, but the damage rides, but not the damage rides. Sadly, this was a final blow to Forest Park. It was a slow and gradual death for the park. The attendance dwindled, rides were being removed, concession stands were closing, and upkeep was demolishing, diminishing. Soon the tombstone appeared. A year after the fire, the Hanover Evening Sun reported that personal family entered into agreement with uh, with the builders to build a, a shopping center on the site. <coughs> Obituary. Their father was August, first of senior. He was born March 26, 1926 in Hanover, Pennsylvania. It died December 14, 1967. <laughs> the last trolley ran February 4, 1939. Your trolley park soon began to die. Cold Springs is now apartments. Elm Beach is now completely gone. Brookside Park, only the carousel building is there. Highland Park is a quarry. And guess what? Forest Park is a strip mall. The music is silent, the bright lights are gone, and the animals on the carousel no longer prance in a merry circle. The thrills offered by many of the rides are now gone. Only the memory of the land exists, excitement exists. 
Yesterday it was a thriving amusement park. Today it is only a fading memory. Unless we record and share these memories, they too will die. Perhaps it's just a sign of our times at Forest Park, which, which brought excitement and joy and laughter to, to many, was raised to be room for an American institution called a shopping center. The next time you're at San, uh, South Hanover Shopping Center, take a moment and close your eyes. You might just hear the roar of the old roller coaster. August Sr. was buried in the cemetery next to the park, so he could always enjoy the sounds and laughter from those many that were there at the park. Okay, here's a, here's a question for you all. What, is, what city is known to have the largest operating trolley system in the U.S.? San Francisco. Any other guess? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, that is correct. Uh, let's see here. Philadelphia uh, has the largest trolley system in the nation, a title that it had since 1970. Funds have been allocated to buy 100 plus new trolleys over the next several years. At the estimated cost of 2.5 to $3 million a piece. Funds have been allocated oh, to buy yeah, 100 new trolley cars. And um, I was down in Philadelphia recently and I saw some of the old trolley lines and stuff. But yeah, the, I was surprised at that. And that was taken out of the uh, uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. And that's an example of one of them. In 1919, just after World War I, there was about a thousand trolley parks in the country. Now, guess how many's left? Out of those thousand parks, today what's left is only 11 parks. And we're going to quickly go through these 11 parks that are left. <laughs> Lake Mount Park in, Al in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Stony Park. In Allentown. Seagrass Park. That's in Rochester, New York. Kennywood Park in West Bedford, Pennsylvania. Midway Park in Naval Springs, New York. Kennedy Park in uh, Salem, New Hampshire. Camden Park in Huntington, West Virginia. Oaks Park in Huntington, West Virginia. Oh, excuse me, Oaks Park in Portland, Oregon. Oaks Park, Jackson, New Jersey. Park that's in Erie. Holden Park that's in uh, Millsburg, Connecticut. Uh, I hope you enjoy the history of Forest Park. Here are some good credits. If 
the appointment with my father, that's him. That's him, and that's me. And I want to say, bury your history before it becomes the forgotten past. <laughs> and this presentation, you might ask, why did you do this? You're in Northern Pennsylvania. My father uh, decided on doing this uh, uh, project after he listened to a Jim Core on on Collins, and I helped him with it. He has he showed it several times to uh, staying room only crowds. Uh, two years ago, he passed away, so again I carry it on for him, um, and I added some things, you know, going through this, and I have. To show it several more times this year. In fact, I'm going to be down Tom Day showing it again. And I'm going to be showing it in Hanover once. And Spring Grove, I'll be showing it there again as well. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, well, I showed this once before in Hanover, and that's why I came in up with some more things to add in here. Because they said, oh, we went to the park. Oh, my father worked there, or this and that. And that's how I found out about the, uh, the bathroom doors opening into the skating ring. You know, because they ran into it a couple of times. Um, so, is there any uh, questions, comments? Um, just recently, I got an email back just last week of one of the uh, early uh, carousels. The person bought has the organ from it. Uh, he purchased it. It wasn't the last uh, carousel they had, but it was one of the earlier ones. Um, so, he, he sent me that information. So, I thought that was pretty neat. Um, but, is there any questions or comments? And uh, Sorry. Go ahead. I did have one question online. Yes. Uh, asking about Glen Echo Park in Maryland. Okay. To my knowledge, it's not, not a trolley park. It's not a trolley park. Um, some people ask about Grenoble's. No, that was not a trolley park. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes. My mother in law is 101 years old. Yes. She has a forest park play at the nursing home where she stays at, and she gets a lot of questions about it. Well, she went only roller skating a couple times, but one of those times she met her husband. Yes. They come here. Oh, wow. Nice story. If, if sometime you can get me a picture of that plate, yeah. I'll put it in the presentation. Okay. okay? Yep. Oh, and guess what? You guys are lucky. Here's some tickets from Forest Park. <laughs> Take a look at it. Too bad they're not good anymore. Um, any other questions? Uh, Mom, man, they, when I was uh, a kid back in the 50s, I was pretty young, but my aunt and uncle lived right across the street from it. And I remember sitting on their front porch looking over there, wanting to go to the park. And I was never allowed to go over there, and I couldn't figure out why they wouldn't let me. But by that time, things were getting a little bit broken down and whatever, found out later. But uh, that was yeah. just a sort of, a, as a kid, a bucket list place to go to. But unfortunately, Never got there. Uh, wasn't able to get there. It was. My grandparents were pretty religious. It was devil worship. <laughs> um, the same way with dancing. Yes. Um, type thing. So there were there were people that were somewhat opposed to the, that type of happiness. Wow. And like I said, I last year I got to meet somebody that actually worked there, and you know he shared some things. You know, he told me about the after the accident on the on the uh, uh, roller coaster. How the August he went out and inspected it every day and walked it every day to make sure it was all right. Have you ever gone tramping around the grounds? You know, behind the shopping center. And... I was there. Yeah, when I did speaking engagement there. Yes. Um, any, any anything? What? Uh, any sign at all? No. The cemetery's there yeah. next door. But no. It's just it's it's a shame. Yes. We had a question about Spoltz Springs Park. Hey, what's that actually in Manchester, right? It was mm -hmm. down by the creek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, it wasn't down by the it wasn't by the creek. No. They had was that? that was um, um that? Yeah. yeah, that was quite oh. That's where the springs are. No, no. Not, 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 not the, the spring the right by the where the apartments are right now behind the uh, post office. And just the post office. And it's called Park Street there. And it was uh, where you get fresh water. You can get, it came out of the springs, out of the ground. You can get water there. 
But no, it wasn't down by the uh, creek itself. Yeah, there, the, uh, there, there, are, oh, there are also springs out by yeah, there's springs, yeah. There's springs, but they're yeah. kind of down uh, north of the apartments down the road. Right. The, so, so the park and Elk Beach were two different places. Right. They were two yeah, different absolutely. close by, but they're two different places. places. Yeah, I have a what my thought was that they were right across the creek from each other. No, no. Are there, are there any pictures of them? Oh, you bring this park? I've never seen one. Yeah. Yeah, lots of them. Yeah, yeah. There's, and I have a couple of uh, uh, company picnics that were held there uh, from New York Flyer and so forth. And this one picture I have is real wall, okay. And this one guy is on one side of the picture, and the same guy is at the other end. When they took pictures, they had taken in sections, but he ran up and ran around to the other end. <laughs> So you see the same guy in both ends of the picture. Were there rides there? No, no. Band, well, bandstand. Park, park. No, there was no, no, it was not really a park. It was more of a uh, picnic road. Picnic right? road, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a picnic road. All right. And then they went down further. Um, and they did have side, they, you couldn't rent a whole trolley to bring people there, and they would park it off to the side. I have pictures of that. Uh, on my website, there's more pictures on the website about Cold Springs and, and um, Elm Beach. I'll look them up. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Now, the question was brought up about the trolleys at Highland Park. Was they always at the bottom and you, you always had to walk up the stairs? Or was the trolley, we don't know, you know, was the trolley stop the people at the top? Which park are you talking about? Highland. Uh, I'm told to. <laughs> yeah. No, the, uh, the, the, uh, Where the far east the trolley gave out the, uh, what is it, Oak Street uh, to uh, Galen Church Road. And it was right in that area. Right, uh, but then you had to climb up all the stairs. Well, or... apparently, I, in my opinion, I don't know this for a fact, I think it sat on a bluff. And I think the trip. The trolley track either went down around Richmond Avenue and came around, or they went around the back of it up because the main entrance was up uh, on the level with uh, Dale and Church Road. Yeah, so the steps down. Yeah. But yeah, they had to go down to get the trolley. To get the trolley, yeah. Did you really? And I think that's one of the difficult areas where they're trying to negotiate concepts for rail trails in that area. Okay, because of the core right now, it's, right? It's even more difficult. I've not seen that many park pictures in Holland Park. They just had some on Facebook the other day. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. I guess, I guess, I guess who put them on? Oh, you did. I got it from you. It's great, Bob. I didn't get it from you, but anyway, yeah, you know, honestly, because I haven't seen it. No. Charlie, thank you so much. You know, uh, in my hand. Yeah, the discussion that might not be only here, uh, the audience, the uh, digital audience might not be only here about Highland Park and, uh, and and where the trolley ran relative to Highland Park. And yeah, I don't know, uh, uh, Richard, whether, you know, uh, whether with the trolley trail running down to Hanover, whether we'll understand more about where Highland Park was and how the trolley's association with it was. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is a fascinating topic, and Charlie really, really brought this to, to life about the Forest Park, and thank you for your dad for getting you <laughs> on, that, uh, on that trail. Uh, next, uh, our next meeting is in early June. It's the yes. first Thursday in June, and we've had some meetings. We're talking about collaboration. We've had some meetings. That we've already had two speakers in to talk about so things that Lancaster and uh, your county have in common. And so we're going to have another uh, speaker, two speakers in, in June. We're going to have uh, Donnie Miller and uh, uh, Corey Von Brookhoven, who's with the story Glittis. And they do a program where the two of them play off each other. And one talks about York County, the other one talks about Lancaster County. I think that this um, symbiosis between the two counties is becoming stronger as the Northwest River Trail goes into play and the NOLA low grade, people are discovering those. And then they're going to build the Mifflin House, um, build out the Mifflin House Park 
and Welcome Center on the right field, Helmut Township side. So the relationship between the two counties is only going to get stronger. So that's one of the things we're doing here, trying to build that relationship between the history communities in the two counties. So that's what we'll be doing in June. Uh, we have uh, Tommy Corey talking about Lancaster in your county. Uh, it, it's, I've seen the program and it's a wonderful the way they go back and forth between between two counties. So thanks everybody for being here tonight. Thanks uh, our digital audience uh, for tuning in. And Charlie, thank you again. Thank you.